So, hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh event of the PCI webinar series. On behalf of the Peer Community Organization, we would like to thank you very much all to be present today. And of course, we also thank uh, Brian Nozek, our speaker for today. He kindly accepted to contribute to this PCI webinar series, and we thank him a lot for that. So um, just an announcement first, the next PCI webinar will take place in three months, uh, the 5th of December, and the speaker will be Lehan Butler, and she's a scholarly communication librarian at the University of Ottawa. Um, so we remind you uh, some very simple rules to make this event uh, efficient, so please, do not switch on your microphone. You shouldn't be able to do so, but I prefer to tell you. The conference is recorded, so please switch off your cameras. And you can use the chat uh, to, write your, to write your questions, your remarks, and you can do that uh, during the talk. And Brian will reply to the questions after the talk, but you are invited to write these questions uh, from the beginning of the talk. So again, we thank Brian. So Brian, who is the executive director of the Center of Open Science, he co-founded three nonprofit organizations. The Project Implicit, so this was to advance research and education about implicit bias. He also founded the Society for the Improvement of Psychological, Psychological Science to improve the research culture in his home discipline. And he also founded the Center for open science costs to improve uh, rigor, transparency, integrity, and reproducibility across uh, research disciplines. And Brian is the current executive director of COS and is also a professor at uh, the University of Virginia in the United States of America. So Brian, you can start uh, whenever you want. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And you can share your screen. I will. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for being a supporter uh, of PCI, uh, these events, and more generally. Uh, PCI is one of the most important uh, innovations activities in the scholarly communication space. And so it is delightful uh, to see the community spirit uh, behind and supporting uh, its advancement and improvement. I'm particularly pleased to present with this group because the things that I'd like to talk about today, I think, are highly complementary and opportunities uh, for uh, collaboration among uh, activities like uh, PCI and others. Uh, so I'll be really eager to get everyone's uh, reactions, feedback uh, about how we're thinking about uh, these issues uh, and other ways uh, that we might consider how to improve uh, the research culture uh, in general uh, and scholarly communication in particular. Well, let's start with just reflecting for a moment on why why did you get into science? What what was your original motivation, your thinking that inspired you to pursue science as a as an occupation? Maybe your story is like mine. As a teenager, of course, I was enthralled by the idea that I could spend a substantial portion of my time applying for grants to do research. And who wasn't excited about the possibility of writing papers and then submitting them over and over and over again to try to get them published uh, in the most prestigious outlet. And of course, uh, you know, when I graduated uh, from uh, high school and was at heading to university, you know, my, my main thought was, wow, I could do science and, and get a large H index. That would be really great. Now, I'm assuming none of us actually had those as underlying motivations. Motivations are much more like interested in discovery, curious about things. I love pushing the boundaries of knowledge. I like to tinker. I like collaborating on problems that are important and figuring out why it's the things might work the way they do. You know, very ordinary motivations. But of course, we recognize the absurdity of H index and publication and pursuing grants as the motivations to do science because 
in the present reality of where we are, they are the primary rewards that help us advance in science. And the scholarly communication practices that we all experience of conducting, sharing, reporting our work are very tightly linked to the scholarly reward system of who gets a job, who gets to keep their job, and who advances uh, in their career. The challenge, of course, that we easily recognize is that the scholarly communication system as it exists is misaligned with how knowledge production actually occurs uh, and advances. The uncertainty, the false starts, the many different turns, the mess eventually over time becoming uh, some insight about different phenomenon is not represented in the paper by paper by paper. Uh, contribution process in scholarly communication. True knowledge production is a social process. It's it, dynamic. There's ideas exchanged, there's challenges made, there's insights gained and lost. <laughs> so the, the point that I have of this uh, presentation is that uh, we need a meta science of scholarly communication, a constant questioning, innovating, testing new ways in which we might improve our scholarly communication practices in the service of advancing knowledge, producing knowledge, insights, solutions, treat, effective treatments, et cetera. So we can do better than the current system because this current system was not designed or optimized uh, for advancing knowledge. It emerged via other ways. And so I want to start with highlighting three trivial and substantial issues, challenges uh, that are have a common origin in how scholarly communication became what it is today. And then I want to broaden out to what the big challenges are. So the first one, oops, now I am trying to advance slides and it's not. Let's see. There we go. The first uh, is one of my very first publications. I got to graduate school in the very late 90s, uh, started publishing in the early 2000s. And like many uh, of you, I suspect, when a paper is accepted and then you get the final thing in print, uh, and especially at the time, getting it in delivered in the mail, here it is, the journal with my article in it. It was fun at that point to now revisit the article that I never wanted to see again after going through the peer review and revision process, but actually seeing it in print was exciting. And so I opened up uh, the article and was actually enthusiastic uh, to look at it and read it again. And I got to one of the figures and I was looking at it. And then I looked at it closer and I said, well, wait a second. This figure is about racial attitudes and the, the caption is about age attitudes. And then I looked at the next figure and oh my God, I switched the captions and the figures, so they referred to the wrong things. What an embarrassment, and now a permanent embarrassment. There was no point in writing a correction. There was no way to pull all of those journals that had been printed and delivered back. I have had to live with this embarrassment for 22 years. Uh, every time I look at this article, knowing, oh my, I can't believe I made this error. So it is silly, but it is also uncorrectable. The way that scholarly communication happens does not uh, allow for uh, errors like this to be fixed. Second example, a little more serious. There's been a significant uh, discussion and debate uh, about the extent to which the current published literature is reproducible or credible. And some of that debate has been grounded in attempts to replicate findings from the published literature with a common observation that when one tries to conduct an independent replication, the evidence for the findings in the paper are much weaker uh, than what they were reported in the original study. And there's lots of potential reasons uh, that that can occur, many of which uh, are very innocent reasons that the finding is there, but something happened in the replication that missed it that the finding is contingent on different circumstances. But some of the discussion about why this might occur is rooted in the reward system itself, 
that some things are more likely to get published than other things, more likely to get positive results published than negative results. And just by factor, for example, of the file drawer effect of ignoring nulls or questionable research practices that might manufacture positive results unintentionally or otherwise, we can end up with an exaggerated literature uh, because of the ways in which the filter of what gets into the system produce uh, ex that exaggeration, giving us making us overconfident in the research process or research outcomes. A third example uh, to highlight is the emergence of markets that give researchers the reward that they need, a publication, but at the expense of the work being credible at all. So predatory journals that pretend uh, that peer review occurred and just provide publication, the outcome, without any uh, actual review process. Paper mills, where the research might be fraudulent, the journal uh, review process might be fraudulent, but what's really fraudulent is that I can just pay and get my name listed as an author without having done any con contribution at all. These markets exist and are thriving because the reward system is about getting a publication not about doing the credible research. So these are three very different examples, but I wanna argue that they have a common origin. And that common origin is that our past publishing on physical paper is partly responsible for the current dysfunction in the research culture. So let me unpack what I mean by that. And first just do a very brief review of how it used to be uh, that publication, uh, the peer review and publication process occurred. And this was still uh, common, even in my early graduate student days in the end of the 90s and early 2000s. We had not transitioned uh, to digital uh, communication, uh, even after some of the emergence of the internet. And even though email, for example, was available for a lot longer. So if in this time period, you might conduct research, you might write the paper, and then you have to actually print it out, four copies usually, bind them together and mail them to the journal. The journal would take three of those copies, mail them out to three potential reviewers. It was very rare to decline to review because it's such a pain in the butt to get this stuff out places. And the journal would mail, receive back uh, the reviews uh, from those reviewers. And then the journal would aggregate that into a decision and mail a decision letter to the author. All of the revisions, the copy editing, proofing, all by postal mail, sending things back and forth. Then once those articles that had been accepted, uh, there are enough of them, the journal would gather them together into issues. They would physically print those issues and they'd mail them all out to subscribers. And non-subscribers could get it because they could just go to the library, uh, and that's how one get had access uh, because you had to have the access to the physical thing. Now, there are a few consequences of that model that got integrated into how it is that peer review and scholarly communication more generally is done that still persist today. So for example, it was very sensible given the paper world to only conduct peer review for publication after the research was already completed. It would have been a real pain in the neck to be doing it at multiple different stages of the review process. Finish your work, write it all up, send us the paper, uh, we'll review that. It made a lot of sense in that world to only review the paper. The other research outputs, data, materials, protocols, that's a lot to mail. It's a lot of hassle to manage. And there isn't really uh, capacity uh, to do that very easily. Uh, so it, why would you even consider all of that uh, in a re review process when you had to physically send the materials? It made a lot of sense to just select a couple of people, select them ad hoc, the editor knows, can find their address and mail them the actual papers. Made a lot of sense to then only ask them to review it holistically. I'm sending you the paper, review the whole paper, give me a general evaluation on all the, any of the features you think are relevant uh, to comment on. And because it's on paper, there had to be a dichotomous decision at the end. Either it's in and we're going to print it or it's not. Sorry, go to the next journal. All of that process of receiving mail, all the reviews, there was hassles in that. There was a lot of work in that. And none of that 
uh, sensibly got surfaced uh, in the actual publication. That's just a lot more pages uh, to print. And so the why would we consider pages on the review process rather than pages for more articles to be printed? Once it's on paper, it's permanent. It's unrevisable. You're not going to change this. It's done, just like my freaking figure. And in this world, publishers played a very useful role. They did things that the research community could not and did not want to do themselves, managing the process of all of this stuff, mailing things around, managing the distribution uh, of all of these things, binding them into issues. Those were functional things uh, for a publisher to do. Now, all of these are remain features of how it is uh, that scholarly communication process happens today. And I think they are directly contributing uh, to the dysfunctions in the credibility of the research culture. So I'll give a brief uh, overview of that. So paper-based scholarly communication leads to these features I just went through on how individual scholarly products are evaluated. You send the paper, it gets evaluated in this way, and a decision is made to accept or reject. In this world, the way that scholars are rewarded is for producing exciting results. It's an outcomes-based review process, so novel results, positive results, tidy results across the experiments and studies are more valued, more likely to get published, more likely to publish in prestigious places than things that don't meet those standards. I'm sure you've heard uh, many talk about this, Chris Chambers railing about the outcomes-based uh, challenges of the current system. The reward system doesn't involve rewarding researchers for sharing, producing, annotating, making clear their data, their materials, their code, the process of doing the research. The evaluation is based on how I characterize what I did in the research in the paper, not how the research was actually done that could be discerned from all of those other things if you could see them. And that reward system is dichotomous, published or not. We know that the peer review process as it exists is not particularly reliable. Three reviewers making variety of different assessments, creating a dichotomous judgment when science is much more complicated than that. It's a peg, and we don't see how it is that the decisions got there. And the rewards are discrete. Uh, you have, you, you get the reward or you don't, uh, and you can count them. In fact, Everybody counts them. Look how many papers I have. Look how much my H index is. Because what is rewarded is the discrete outcome of published uh, or not. Now, the consequences of rewarding scholars for those things have impact on how knowledge actually ends up getting produced as a system. All of those factors challenge the credibility of the research. If we're outcomes-based in how we reward researchers, we're going to create things like the file drawer effect, questionable research practices, p-hacking, because the outcomes are what matter for the reward. Without data and materials, without full insight into the research process, we undermine the ability to self-correct. And in fact, when the outcomes are permanent and unrevisable, we further challenge the ways in which self-correction could occur. We embrace unreliable systems, that are challenged in their validity of actually assessing on quality rather than on excitement, rigor, or otherwise. And this system allows for, in fact, encourages the creation of dysfunctional markets like predatory journals and paper mills and committing fraud. Because if they can sell you the reward that you need, the publication, then I can get what I need without doing all of the work. This is uh, replaced by digital communication, potentially, but this system still exists in the way that it is. And the reason that it still exists in the way that it is, despite having moved to digital communication, which removes all of those paper-based limits, is that there are a bunch of impediments to changing the system. Just this inertia, this is how we've always done it, this is how we're going to do it. System justification, well, if we're doing it this way, it must be that it's good. Why would we be doing this way if it was bad? Publisher business models are resistant uh, to changing this approach. And 
the risk and uncertainty of the unknown. If we change these things, then what will happen? <laughs> right? If we remove this way of doing peer review, then who knows if it will actually make research more credible or improve the self-correction processes. And so that can feel risky uh, in an environment where we don't have uh, the evidence uh, yet or the experience with it. But the core issue from my perspective is that all of us that are trying to do credible research would be advantaged by challenging and adapting, changing, evolving, revolutionizing that system. And that's because doing credible research is hard. It's really hard. And this primary signal that we have at present for saying this is credible research is publication. Is it published? Was it peer reviewed? Is that a high status outlet? And the challenge, of course, is that there are many paths to achieve publication that is only mimicking that the research is actually credible and having less effort to get there. I can be not transparent on how it is I got to my findings. It's a lot easier to not show my data, my materials, my process, my code, and just tell you, I found this. Trust me, this is what I found. It's easier for me to get publishable results and get the rewards that I need by employing select uh, questionable research practices, making my research look better uh, than it might be if I was more systematic and rigorous with my approach. Even not intending to be, just my rationalization for choices that I make. If I ignore my negative results, I'm more likely to get publishable findings. So selective reporting is an outcome uh, of these pressures. And then of course, all of the more uh, misconduct oriented activities of predatory journals, fraud, paper mills, are all ways to avoid doing the work and still get the signal of credibility. So a system that we would all want to be in is one where doing credible research is actually what is rewarded. And so a system change that makes it so that the rewards are really based on the credibility and rigor and quality of our work should be one that we're constantly striving for. And the current system isn't there. So I wanna talk about an alternative model that we have been uh, conceptualizing for a while, talking with lots of different groups uh, about uh, developing a community partnership to pursue uh, that we're actually launching uh, as a as a uh, R and D project uh, now, and we're, I'm hopeful that this will generate some interest or at least uh, some discussion uh, about potential merits, challenges, opportunities for it. So to set the stage, we can sort of now with that context, what are the key challenges that we want to try to confront and change? As I just discussed, the scholarly communication inhibits research progress because. It's a slow process, it's incomplete in information, it's opaque and it's static. Once it's there, it's effectively there forever. It could be faster if we opened up the full research life cycle and made it so that the way in which we understood what the research is evolved with the research as it's being done and as it's being evaluated, rather than considering scholarly communication a single point in time of here's the paper, and an assumption that everything before and everything after is irrelevant for the evaluation and communication process. We inhibit the process now because we treat the paper as the only meaningful scholarly output. Whereas we could treat all the processes, the outputs, the outcomes themselves as scholarly contributions to both value them, upgrade them, and then increase the fullness of information that we have about our research and its credibility. The current system offers a dysfunctional, overly simplistic rewards based on published or not and status of outlet. We could have a much more accelerated system, perhaps, if that reward system was based on a diverse set of assessments that are meaningfully about the research quality rather than a singular up or down that has a lot of vagueness, is only a proxy uh, of actual direct assessments of quality. And the current system inhibits progress because it's based in 
legacy, commercial, paper-based business models and processes and infrastructure. We're now at a point in technology evolution that the mechanisms of scholarly communication can be governed and operated and experimented with by the research community itself. We don't need in the same way as we used to, to outsource the process and management of scholarly communication to an agent that has other interests in mind, rather beyond just producing the best possible work and having a discussion uh, about its meaning and implications. So the project uh, that we are pursuing, and I'll give a highlight overview, is called Lifecycle Journal. It's open, transparent, community run, and our purpose for this uh, research and development period is to see whether it has sufficient promise to really invest in it. So we have uh, about $500,000 US per year invested for, for three years to conduct the project. And as we go through it, a community of evaluations will inform whether we look for opportunities to turn this into an actual community-based product that could be scaled uh, and used more broadly. So this project period is really an initial testing and experimentation period uh, that we hope everybody will be interested uh, in getting involved in in one way or another. So I'll just highlight a few key features. The first is to embrace the research life cycle, that research communication can be included from starting with planning, pre-registrations, data management plans, whatever it is uh, that is done at the outset of research to develop the questions, develop the research designs, develop the approach. That can be part of what's communicated in the process. The materials, the contents, the outputs that are generated while conducting the research, the data, materials, code, protocols, that also should be part of the scholarly communication. And ideally, it would emerge as the work is being done. The report is obviously an important part of scholarly communication. It's the summary of what it is we think we've learned and how we integrate the research that we've done together. But our emphasis is that the paper is just one piece of the overall scholarly pr product from a project. And so we shouldn't privilege the paper uh, over everything else. And then there's all of the discussion that happens afterwards, the peer review process as we understand it today, but then the review process that we do as a community that happens for years uh, beyond that can inform and change how it is we understand that particular contribution. That should be part of the process and enable revision of reporting in a natural way so that that error that I made in that uh, figure, someone notices it and says, oh, you made an error there. And I say, oh my gosh, okay, let me fix it. And then the report is fixed and it's addressed. An error in my analysis, somebody points out how that was an error, how it might change uh, the out outcomes. I should be able to incorporate that in an easy, transparent, fulsome way. So that's feature one. A second feature is that the evaluation of that scholarly communication should likewise parallel across the entire research life cycle. So if you submit your research plan uh, to the uh, life cycle journal, you might have different evaluation services assessing it for different reasons, assessing different things as you go. So for example, that plan might be evaluated by PCI registered reports and they generate a recommendation uh, based on uh, their assessment. As you commit to that plan and initiate the research, if it's in the social sciences, the social science prediction platform might uh, offer it as something that the community gets to weigh in and make predictions and discuss how those, what the implications of different outcomes of the research would be uh, for understanding that area of research. As you get to sharing uh, the results of your work and the data and the code and everything else, Dataseer, a, a machine-based service, might look at the paper and extract information about what data is shared, where it's shared, and provide a quality assessment uh, of the transparency and sharing uh, of the work uh, in terms of the components uh, of the research process. And as that work gets out into the community, the Institute for Replication might say, 
we want to see if your findings are reproducible. So we'll take your data and your code and we'll reanalyze it and we'll generate a report saying, is that finding reproducible or not? Now, of course, those are just four examples of independent evaluation services that are providing different types of assessment of the research itself. But there are many different services that have been emerging, very, some very experimental, some maturing, some having an actual organization behind them, some being just a project uh, done in a lab or by a few collaborators that are all looking at different ways to assess the quality of research on some different type of dimensions. And what a great experience it would be for the community to have a platform where there's a marketplace of different evaluation services that are trying different ways to assess quality, to both experiment with them directly, get feedback from the community of authors and readers about their experience with those evaluation services, and to get some comparative data across different ways in which evaluation is being done to both compare against one another about their qualities, but also then perhaps to feed information from one evaluation service to another to help inform their various assessments. So that marketplace of independent evaluation services is the key part uh, of how it is that the concept of the life cycle journal will operate. So you can imagine what it would look like uh, in something like this land on the web page of the project that's uh, in the life cycle journal, and it has some general metadata information about what the work is. And the paper isn't privileged over the other parts uh, of the research project. Uh, they're all listed. But the key part, of course, is the evaluations by those individual evaluation services. The journal itself does no evaluation. It just has initial criteria for what's eligible to be included in the evaluation process, but it is not doing any editing in the substantive way. All of the editing review, all of that is done by these independent services. And each of those services and their outcomes is presented on how it assessed uh, this paper. And so there might be, in this case, four different services provided some evaluation. They have some summary uh, of how they assess this research. And then you can go and see all of the details of that evaluation uh, by per going you know, a link further. Also, because of the potential revision process in this, authors might get their feedback and say, oh, that was a great idea. Oh, I could change this. How about this? And revise and resubmit if they are interested. And then the review service can decide, do we want, do we need to update our evaluation based on this new one? Do we want to evaluate it again based on the new submission? Or do we let our prior review stand? And so the review services can make decisions about updating uh, which versions of the submission their evaluation applies to and when those occurred. And we can also have, because there's many varieties of different types of evaluation services, some of them, like the error service, might look at everything. We want, to, we want to do an audit of your entire research process and content. Whereas review comments might say, We're, we just want to evaluate the paper. And all of that's fine. It just provides context for what these different evaluation services are doing. So the idea is that we can move the primary goal for researchers, authors, from can I get it published which is in this case, relatively trivial. It's just meet the basic eligibility criteria to go through this pipeline and move it to, can I get quality evaluation? And can I be responsive to that evaluation to improve my work over time? Which changes what is rewarded from getting that singular signal, publishing lifecycle journal means nothing, to can I get evaluations from my peers to illustrate the qualities, strengths, weaknesses of my work? And can I participate in that scholarly process about how it is our work has limits and strengths and ways to improve it as we go? So there's a number of different questions. I want to uh, address a couple of highlight ones uh, and then close out so that we can have some uh, discussion about the possibilities uh, that come to mind with this model. A first obvious one is when is it done? When, because if you can revise forever, then maybe you just revise forever. Also, what's the commitment that researchers are making? Our concept is that we want to try this as 
the author decides. There are some models like this, eLife is doing it this way, where the author decides whether and when to assign a version of record. And for that, it transitions from a reviewed preprint or any other terminology you'd want to use from the present into a publication. That is a signal that the authors consider this finished uh, in the normal way we think of research to be finished, but still doesn't preclude the possibility that that post-publication review elicits new insights and other things that the authors might decide to revise nevertheless and get an updated uh, version to DOI uh, of that version of record. The other key element of this is that if the author is deciding whether to assign a version of record or not, they can decide not to assign a version of record because they don't know about this life cycle journal thing. They're interested to try it out and get the experience of getting these reviews, but they want to hold on to that possibility of submitting this work to the existing system of journals. Uh, and so if they decline to assign a VOR, then they can submit the paper uh, at the end uh, to a journal as they would normally. And they still have all of this evaluation. The lifecycle journal model doesn't care uh, if they uh, publish it elsewhere. It's all open, all openly licensed. Of course, we would like to not have the endpoint for research be published journal articles as they currently exist in the current system, because that'll just keep propped up that system. Uh, but we need to have that allowance of giving p authors that option so that we can dramatically reduce the risk of participating in this. If you can publish it normally like you would always do it, then that has very little risk of participating in this as an experiment. An obvious issue that comes up in thinking about this model is, boy, it sounds like a lot more burden. There are more evaluation services. There's more happening across the entire research lifecycle. We're already busy enough. Can we do all of this? And that is a very reasonable question, but I would argue that the answer is not certain. Uh, and the reason I think it's not certain uh, is because there, the reward system changes in some fundamental ways. If it's not just about getting the publication, and it's now about getting evaluations and getting quality evaluations and improving the quality of my work because the evaluations are what people pay attention to, then it rewards people for being more careful, more rigorous. And so we may see over time, if this thing were to move to scale, that the overall rate of producing publications, papers, would decline and the quality of each individual paper on average would increase. We don't know, uh, but that's a possibility. Another thing that this avoids uh, is serial review of the same paper going to journal A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F, which creates a lot of burden on the system because all this needs to do is get into uh, the system, meet basic eligibility criteria, and then it's in one place getting evaluated and reevaluated, which may end up being a wash uh, against the system where papers get reviewed over and over again. And a key one, obviously, is will it count to participate uh, in such an alternative model? The key aim that we have in thinking about this is that we want to meet the current reward system as it exists. I need to be able to publish my papers and put them on my CV as they are published, and they get a DOI, and they're indexed in the places that they need to be indexed. We need that in order for people today to be able to participate in this without taking risks. But the obvious goal is an and. It's not just that. It's the additional things that are the real potential and benefits uh, of a different model like this. And so our ideal is that we can meet the current standards and shift the attention over time to the evaluation services being the mechanism of reward. So on your CV, you would have the thing that you recognize as a normal thing on CV, and you would add, this paper is so good that PCI registered reports recommended it. My work is so robust that the Institute for Replication was able to independently reproduce it. My work is effectively documented and shared that the fair sharing gave its stamp of approval of rating it fair work. If this kind of model works, then the concept of the life cycle journal as 
the brand becomes irrelevant. It's just a platform. It's just a mechanism for what authors need, which is to be connected to those evaluation services. The evaluation services individually and collectively are the work that makes, do the work uh, that makes everything credible. And so the Lifecycle Journal would operate much more like the App Store uh, for an iPhone, where nobody cares about the App Store except for it being the vehicle to connect users with applications. That should be true here. No one should care about Lifecycle Journal or that something appears in it. What we should be caring about is how was your work evaluated? By who was it evaluated? How did you respond uh, to those evaluations? So, in the ideal of all of this working as beautifully as one could conceive it, what changes uh, in this reward system now that we've embraced digital communication? Well, what we're proposing in this type of model is that the evaluation of individual scholarship would have multiple scholarly outputs, not just the paper, but the data, the materials, the code, many components. There would be a diverse set of assessments of different evaluation services that look at that and provide different points of view of the qualities uh, of that work. All of that would be open so that you could engage with the scholarly contribution of critique, of evaluation, of assessment as part of the scholarly communication. That they have many different criteria that they use, that it occurs over the life cycle, and that the assessment of that individual scholarship is revi itself revisable. Oh, you made some changes and improved it. Our assessment changes as a consequence. Those reward systems that were based on outcomes are not relevant uh, in this model because you're already getting evaluated uh, as uh, you're in the system and getting evaluated before the outcomes are observed. And so we're more likely in such an environment, we think, uh, to get the reward system moving towards rigor and quality of the work that we do, the outputs that we produce. We move it away from publication because that's trivial to achieve in this and toward evaluation. It's like I am rewarded because I got the peer review. Whereas in the current system, peer review is just in the way uh, of the reward that I need, the publication. Ideally, this marketplace of evaluation services is open, it's diverse, and it's constantly innovating. Oh, maybe we could try this way of doing assessments. Let's experiment with this. And an experimental innovating uh, environment then creates more dynamism in the reward structure itself so that it's constantly improving. And with this revisability, we can actually reward correction. We can reward people for identifying errors and for addressing errors uh, as they occur, rather than that just being an embarrassment in the current system. If all of those are true, then knowledge production also improves. The credibility of the research going through a process is better. We have self-corrective processes built in rather than just being these appendages that are painful uh, to try to deal with. We have a constant environment of testing and improving uh, the reward system and the individual basis of rewards. And those fraudulent services, predatory journals, paper mills, and otherwise, have a much harder time succeeding in such an environment because this kind of environment is transparent from the start. It's producing and making available all of the components of research as it happens. And the real advantage of the fraudulent services in the current system is that they can produce that, that simple signal with very little work behind the scenes. And when you open the behind the scenes, now suddenly they have to do things like create a fake data set and create a fake peer review process and actually get evaluated uh, by these evaluation services. They can't hide uh, with no evaluation. And so it will be much, much harder, not impossible, and they'll constantly find new ways uh, to make a buck uh, off it, not credible research. Uh, but the transparency and the openness across the life cycle will address that in substantial ways. So those are the core ideas uh, of what we want to try. Uh, if you find this interesting, we'd love any feedback that you have uh, and your participation in it. Our expectation uh, is that we will uh, launch this in some way at the beginning of uh, next year, 2025. 
Uh, Eileen Clancy has joined uh, the Center for Open Science and is the uh, the managing editor uh, of uh, this project. And she is working uh, with many different groups already uh, to align on how it is these evaluation services will work, how they'll interact with each other, how we will gather the materials, uh, send them to them, receive evaluations and service all that. Uh, create the visualizations and everything else, make sure that it's all embedded for uh, discovery uh, and uh, in uh, the, the various services. Uh, so there's a lot of work already happening, but if you're interested in it, being an author, many of you probably already are reviewers through PCI and perhaps some of these other services. Thank you for participating and supporting those services. And if you have additional uh, evaluation services that are just in theory uh, or things that you see or, or are doing yourself of trying new ways to evaluate, this is an opportunity for doing uh, some of that work together uh, on papers and projects uh, that are submitted through this process. And finally, if you do meta science research and you're looking for ways to evaluate the quality of things, the ideal goal of this as a project uh, is that it's constantly involving investigation and study and evaluation of the project itself as a life cycle journal so that it can likewise uh, keep improving. So I will end uh, with that uh, and see if there are any questions uh, in the chat and welcome uh, questions uh, otherwise. So thanks very much uh, for coming uh, and attending. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for the talk. It was absolutely fantastic. And I think that there are many remarks and questions in the chat, uh, in the chat uh, room. So uh, if you agree, Brian, you can try to take one by one the, the questions. And we may be a bit short of time because normally it, start, it stops uh, at 5 p.m. Okay, so in, in 12 minutes, so it's too short. So we will have to, to go further if you, if you are okay with that. So you are basically uh, the master here and you can reply every question you want in the chat. So can you see them? Yes, okay. I, I may not see them all uh, just as I'm scanning quickly, but uh, I'll start where I can start here. Um, yeah. uh, Julianne asks, will the recordings be available? Yes, uh, the recordings for this will be available. Yeah, there are, uh, yeah, there are a number of questions like that that we already replied on that. Okay, for great. Us, so, yeah. I, I won't I won't address those. So, uh, Cindy Morris uh, comments. I'm not comfortable with the idea that doing credible research is hard. It is fun, enriching, a way to create cohesive community. I can't disagree with that at all. I love <laughs> research. I mean, I love it. I love doing uh, credible research. But the the point of it being hard is that it is takes effort. Uh, it takes work uh, to do actual credible research. Uh, and there are shortcuts in the current system that avoid doing the work uh, and still get the credit. And the negative consequence of that is that those of us that are, and which is most of us, are wanting to do credible research are disadvantaged in career outcomes because of the availability of shortcuts that do not promote credibility. So thanks for highlighting the fact that we're, we're here because that's fun. We like doing it. We should be rewarded for it too. Okay. Uh, Thomas uh, asks, uh, reward processes dichotomous published or not? Uh, don't you think that the multiplicity of journals with varying levels of stringency make a more continuous reward process? An article that is rejected in journal A can be accepted in journal B because, for example, they require different levels of evidence. There may be room for diversity. I think in principle, that is correct. Uh, how much it is correct in practice is not at all clear. Um, a couple of thoughts. One is, let's assume it's correct. It is a, itself a highly burdensome way uh, to sort through the credibility of research. If journals really were ordered from A, B, C, D, and F uh, in terms of quality, then the fact that you have to go to journal A and then go to journal B and then go to journal C and then go to journal D is an inefficient and slow process for sorting out how credible uh, we think these things are. But added to that, the unreliability of the evaluation process, the fact that individual uh, reviewers uh, may be favorable or unfavorable given the day, given the journal, given the otherwise, it's hard uh, to have a lot of confidence in that. 
And then finally, we don't know in the current system what those criteria are and how they vary and how consistent they are in any given journal uh, in terms of their application. And so there isn't a way to have a lingua at present, there isn't a way to have a shared understanding uh, of what it means that a particular paper is in a particular journal. Um, so I think we can get closer to what you're describing by opening up the process and making it a shared environment where all of these evaluations occur. Uh, Leslie says, but you must admit the credible research takes a lot of effort and time. Oh, okay. Responding uh, to Cindy's earlier point. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, John Meese says, one unmentioned group who contribute most to maintaining the status quo is those who have benefited the most. Do you consider the Matthew effect to be one of the biggest obstacles to change? I think that's a very uh, good point. Uh, it, is, uh, it is those that have power uh, that they're most likely to keep to reinforce uh, the system as they know it uh, and as they have succeeded in it. Uh, so that certainly is a big barrier to change, especially when long-term success uh, in a system also then elevates one seniority and co contribution to the control and maintenance of that system. So who becomes senior editors at important journals? Well, it's people who have had accomplishments in that system uh, to be able to get uh, a high status role like that. So that certainly is an impediment uh, to the change in the status quo. So thanks for pointing that out. Uh, Lavinia says, is anyone familiar with the platform uh, chaos.com, Q-E-I-O-S.com? Uh, it is a, um, oh, so she continues, I was recently contacted to review a paper for them, uh, and now I get bombarded with offers to publish with them. The info I find online only makes me more confused. Uh, it is one of the innovative uh, services that's trying to alter the model uh, of peer review and separate it to some degree from the traditional journal system. Um, my experience with these so far, I have a clear favorite and we're all here uh, with that clear favorite, but there are many different uh, uh, efforts like this that I think are worth trying uh, and are pursuing different ways to try to be uh, successful, create a uh, useful model. And I think that experimentation is really important uh, and valuable. Uh, so they are they are one of those. Thanks for highlighting that. Uh, Denise uh, says, given that we have already struggled to find reviewers for traditional evaluations, is it realistic to think that we'll be able to find enough people to evaluate so many steps in the process? Is it, you know, that would be great, but is it feasible? Excellent question. Uh, and we don't know. So the reason to do the experiment is to see uh, how this goes. I gave a few answers uh, at the end uh, of my remarks, but just to elaborate a little bit, there are a couple of different things I think that are opportunities uh, that are not the case in the traditional valuations. One is that we can do a much better job of making the participation in doing an evaluation rewarded in and of itself. So peer reviewers that do reviews, especially when those reviews are transparent, can become the basis of advancing one's scholarly reputation. And I think we need more experimentation with how to do that, how to do it well, and under what conditions is transparent, open review, you know who did the review versus closed to avoid uh, some of the potential uh, challenges, social challenges of uh, disagreement and debate. Um, so there's a lot to sample with there. The other important clarification point is that these, these services operate independently from one another. So if you are participating as a reviewer, you're participating with that evaluation service rather than with all of the services uh, for this particular uh, project that's going through. So each of them develop their own communities, their own norms. And what is can be great about that is that there are ways for researchers that have their own specific interests to participate in exactly the type of evaluation service that supports that interest. So someone might say, I love reproducing findings. I love taking code and data and seeing if I can get the same results. So they could sign on to be a reviewer through the Institute for Replication to do reproduction analyses and spend only their time doing that. And they wouldn't have to be burdened with other parts of the review process 
uh, that aren't they aren't as enthusiastic about. And so that diversification of the types of evaluation services offers more opportunities to make those evaluation services fit for purpose to researchers' own interests, and might they might be even more efficient and effective uh, in delivery. Again, this is all in theory. We'll, we have to sort of experiment with these and see how it goes, but it's a very important point on the overall feasibility of creating a scalable solution. Uh, okay, Cindy asks, maybe you'll answer the question later in the talk, what is the economic model for all the services that you're listing? Who are their employers, uh, employees? Where do they get their salaries? Uh, the current set, there's maybe 20 uh, different review services, uh, evaluation services that are participating. Some of them are invested in by uh, an organization. They're a service that an organization provides, and so they may have some sort of uh, sustainability model through uh, the organization. Some are highly experimental, uh, just contributed to uh, by passion, uh, and others uh, may have uh, sort of emerging uh, sustainability models. So there, because many of these already exist, uh, we're confident in the initial stages of being able to create a marketplace and test its viability. My sense, and this is again, uh, like many of the things here is speculative, is my sense is that many of these services that are right now operating independently, the social sciences prediction platform, the Institute for Replication, data seer or otherwise, they are, I think, more likely to struggle with sustainability operating in isolation and more likely able to establish a sustainability model through a collective platform like this, because it can highlight and focus on, they can highlight and focus on the things that their service is particularly good at, can raise the visibility of the value add of that service uh, to a collection uh, of assessments. Uh, and the services can become mutually reinforcing, perhaps lowering the uh, overall cost of just running the services and increasing the overall impact uh, of those services individually. So I, I have, uh, hope uh, for those things, but this, this is another part of why do it as a pilot rather than just jump in is because the issue that you call out could be the fatal flaw is that there's just no sustainability model uh, that is viable for this. Uh, okay, uh, next ones. Oh, and please interrupt me if you want me to elaborate on uh, anything or get off on, on the wrong side. No, I just want to say that, okay, it's 5 p.m., so normally this is the theoretical uh, time to stop, but I think that we are still motivated to go on. So, Brian, if you agree, you can go on replying questions, and yes. uh, and the audience can stay to, to, to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, yeah, and everyone can leave. That's no problem. I won't be offended. I won't even really know because I can only see myself. Uh, so, and you need to go, <laughs> go ahead. Um, uh, Alexandra says, after every PCI seminar, I'm very encouraged by how much can be done, how much can be improved, how many people have the enthusiasm and ideas on how to do it, and then the reality and the overwhelming amount of scientific blandness and hopelessness catches up with me. Oh, God. Uh, why is there just still more of it? Uh, so she says, this is a rhetorical question, perhaps. Uh, I feel your pain, uh, and I have been never been more optimistic uh, about the potential uh, for actually ch making progress on changing the reward system and improving the research culture more generally. I think the last dozen years uh, has um, created both a recognition of the need to improve the research culture, and that's not just on reproducibility, but it's on working conditions and many other dimensions of inclusion and who gets to be involved and how they get to be involved in research. And the attention to those issues that are about the research culture is not just people saying something needs to be done, but there is an amazing emergence of people trying things, doing things, experimenting with different ways uh, that the research culture could work, different tools or innovations that might improve research practice. And that is a very exciting thing. Uh, there's so much happening and increasing investment uh, by funders uh, that I think we are at the cusp of a real reformation process that is uh, not just innovating, 
but also evaluating how it is we do our research and can do it better. If you're interested in those issues, let me strongly encourage that you attend the MetaScience uh, conference. Uh, MetaScience.info is the website. Uh, it's scheduled uh, for June 30th to July 2nd uh, next year. Uh, it will be in London uh, next year. Uh, and it is a gathering place for people uh, that are really interested in developing and testing new ways uh, of doing different parts of science, how we fund research, how we evaluate research, how research gets communicated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is a real, there, there is a real community uh, emerging and I'm uh, excited that so many of us uh, are doing things that just blow my mind every day. So thanks everyone for your contributions there. And thanks for uh, addressing that issue, Alexandra. Uh, Cindy Morris says, is there one place where all the publications live? Aren't there questions about hegemony and governance? Great call out. Um, so everything uh, would be openly licensed. In the pilot, uh, we are keeping it simple and use, just using whatever technologies we have that are as much fit for purpose for managing uh, the research lifecycle. Uh, as it is. We're not investing in engineering uh, to build new technologies. And part of the evaluation process for the Lifecycle Journal will be figuring out what are the gaps in the existing technology and infrastructure that can support this. And are there already existing tools that we might sort of stitch together, use the PCI platform, stitch together with something that uh, evaluation services can interact with, that's stitched together with something else, or do we need some new pieces uh, to be built? The primary goal is how can we do this as a public goods infrastructure that may, is also modular. So each of these evaluation services has its own way of doing its work. And we wanna help them preserve that way of doing the work and create easy pathways to interface uh, with the system that just helps manage the process. And that's really the only role that lifecycle journals should play uh, is managing the communications uh, between the evaluation services uh, and uh, the authors uh, doing the work and the readers uh, absorbing uh, the work. So that's the real ideal is that the ownership is distributed and there isn't any centralization in the, in the ways in which your, your question suggests, uh, but it's a really important uh, item to be attentive to uh, and to make sure it gets built into whatever longstanding uh, solution gets pursued, if any. So thanks for that. Uh, Thomas asks, the market of evaluation services is probably very useful to authors to improve their work or to specialists. I wonder if non-specialist readers would benefit of it or if it would be too complex for them to understand it. This is also a great question that has many potential uh, outcomes. One of the ways in which I've thought about the open science movement more generally is that sharing data, sharing code, sharing all of the things behind the research itself, and that includes the assessments and evaluations, isn't for everyone because not everyone has the time to dig into that. It is so that someone that is interested could dig into it. So even if your data set that you spent a lot of time sharing was only reused by one person, and that one, one person was able to reanalyze and reproduce your findings. That's a benefit for the whole community uh, because they have access to that and they can do some independent verification. So I think people will calibrate in th their own ways for their own interests, how deep they go into a transparent system of evaluation and assessment. For things that aren't in my research domain, I might be quite happy with the cover slide of here are the evaluation services that did evaluate and what some simple indication of whether they evaluated it favorably or not. For others where it's like close to my interests or research that I'm really involved in in some way or another, I might want to go dig down and see how that was evaluated, understand those assessments and why and what the back and forth is. And that's just gonna be something that I decided idiosyncratically as a reader, and every reader would decide idiosyncratically based on the particular topic and everything else. So the opportunity is not, let's overwhelm everyone. It's how do we give people entry points so that they can dig as deep as they want into it 
And if they don't want to, that they can take the surface level assessments and just have that and move on. In the same way that a title and an abstract and a paper provide easy ways for us to search and filter uh, as we're traversing the literature itself. Many, most papers, I just read the title. Some more papers, I also read the abstract. A few papers, I read the whole paper. That's the same concept I think will apply. So thanks for that. Uh, okay, let me jump to Francois. Can we really disentangle the scholarly communication system from the scholarly assessment system? Or in other words, is this going to change if we don't change the ideals of hiring committees, research assessment committees, and thus the type of awards that scientists are looking for? This is a very astute and important point, is that this does not exist in isolation. Uh, we have to have the various levers of decision-making for important points uh, in the research culture all shift uh, in how it is uh, they are responsive to research evidence of quality, of rigor, of excitement, or whatever. So if hiring committees say, we don't care about this thing, we will never care about this thing, we only care if it's published in Nature, Science, and Cell, then it's not going to matter uh, that this system offers all of these great things, uh, no matter how it does it, uh, because the rewards are the rewards for who gets that job, uh, get them in those journals. So the project of shifting a research culture cannot be pursued in isolation with just this activity and then hoping that the rest will change. Simultaneously, we can't wait for each of those components to change on hopes that they'll just do so because they should do so. So a lot of the change movement requires demonstrating through practice, through evidence, that there is another way and giving those uh, other agents of change opportunities to learn and to see that some of their peers are shifting their practices to be aligned uh, with more rigor, more quality and otherwise. So there's interesting movements in working in isolate in small pockets of changing uh, the valuation assessments of hiring committees of research assessment. Koara is a very important movement uh, that is uh, pushing uh, on how do we change these to be more effective. And so some loose coordination and communication between those that are working on changing the reward system and other parts of the research landscape with elements like this will be really important to sort of help them each maximize their impact. Uh, but it's a very important point. It will not succeed if Francois' uh, issue is not addressed effectively. So thanks for raising that. Uh, Gavin uh, says, uh, do you envision a future where hiring committees, for example, look at the breakdown of checks summaries for each manuscript per candidate, or perhaps moving toward article specific metrics like citations, interactions become more relevant? It's an excellent point to raise uh, because it's very hard to predict how it is that the assessment of researchers will evolve as the individual components of their contributed research also evolve. Um, what I would love to see is something like uh, the assessment of restaurants. So this is over trivializing it. So this is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, to be Zagat rated is itself an achievement in the restaurant world, right? You get, they put on the, the restaurant door, Zagat rated us because Zagat deciding uh, that this restaurant is worth rating is itself an accomplishment. So I would love to see the evaluation services because of their reputation and credibility take on a way that we imagined journals to serve this role, but actually are much more directly associated with the evaluation itself, which is if PCI registered reports gives this a recommended, recommended uh, evaluation, then that itself means something. And for a committee that's evaluating a researcher, that might be as deep as they can go, is looking at those recommendations of the quality of work uh, from different evaluation services. 
The fact that I can also say, look, the Institute for Replication independently reproduced my finding might then provide some diversity for that evaluation committee to say, we don't just need to say, did peers think that it was good work, but do we have evidence that the actual work itself is reproducible? Do we have evidence that they're effective at their sharing and making their data fair? And so the hope for me would be that evaluation committees would see that the diversity of evaluation services means that they can diversify their metrics and prep and their both quantitative metrics and the qualitative assessments uh, that are available in the full evaluation of the record. This is this is a big uh, challenge uh, and uh, it, it, it's not going to have easy or quick solutions. We can anticipate it's on the decade scale uh, that we would see meaningful shifts uh, in the type of issues as uh, Gavin raises. Uh, okay, Nicholas says, uh, what would be the reward for people participating in these satellite services involved in the process of work publication? I think there should be some kind of stimulus to participating in this new holistic review process. I agree. Uh, there have been different ways in which uh, we've talked about the labor of peer review being more effectively rewarded. So some have argued, you know, could, because by and large, it's an entirely free contribution in publications, right? Volunteer service that we provide. And we get no credit uh, in the current system uh, for having done that, except for a very simple line uh, on the CV, which has virtually no impact uh, on our assessment of us as researchers. So I think there are multiple ways that we need to try to challenge that. And some of that might be that these evaluation services actually provide some form of payment or otherwise uh, to people that are willing to uh, conduct evaluations through the service. That has its own challenges uh, for creating sustainable models for it. I think, and this is just a hypothesis, a more realistic approach would be to have peer review, being an evaluator of research, be more explicitly incorporated into understanding how a researcher is evaluated in their job, especially in academic environments. Right now, it's invisible, so you don't actually get the credit uh, as, uh, as part of your academic work uh, doing review. But there's an implicit expectation that this is just something you do as an academic researcher. We need to make that more visible so that it is clearer and explicit that a portion of my time in my academic role is evaluating the research of others. And that's part of my job that my institution is paying me to do. That I think is a more realistic model because it's implicitly already how it works. We're doing it based on the, we're able to do that based on either just, we're just gonna do it as a volunteer or because our institutions give us enough flexibility in our work uh, to decide to devote some of it to evaluation. But it's very important, I think, to integrate it much more directly uh, with how researchers are rewarded and evaluated, or else it's going to be hard to sustain that. So thanks for that. Uh, Brian, it is yes. a quarter past five, so you may be very tired to reply to these <laughs> questions, and we, we can perfectly understand that. So uh, how do you want to proceed? Do you want to continue, or do you want to stop because it's exhausting and it's, and it's, it's okay now? Uh, how what about you... let's, if you, if you've looked further into it, if there are a few that you want to highlight, uh, that we can close out, uh, as examples, I'm happy to do that. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that we have done this job. Uh, uh yourself. I mean, let's just scan the questions. There are still 70 people here, so I don't know if they wish to stay. There is problem. another question by Leslie and Francois Massol. The two next questions, maybe you can reply quickly to them, and then we sure. will try to scan the, the rest. Okay. Uh, Leslie, uh, oh, great question. Is this going to be discipline specific? So for the pilot period, this two, three year uh, project period, uh, if there is a evaluation service uh, for that uh, that does holistic peer review like PCI does, 
uh, for that particular discipline or topic, then it will be eligible uh, to be submitted through the life cycle journal process. So what we're establishing for this period is we want to, at minimum, provide the service so that the peer review you would expect normally uh, can occur uh, on what you submit. Uh, and then the additional services, some of them you know, are machine-based and they can apply to any type of discipline. Other ones are very discipline specific. Um, so that will be our limiting factor of what is allowed to be included or not, is it the, the presence of, of evaluate uh, a standard, as it were, uh, peer review, holistic peer review service for that topic. So thanks for uh, pointing that out. Uh, Francois, how are review mills not going to be able to compete with the, a genuine system like this? They already used AI to generate false reviews of papers. I'm not completely sure they won't find a way to also hijack reviews at other steps of the process. I think you're pointing exactly the right risk, which is overwhelmed by generation of uh, fake content. Um, so this is uh, going to be, and this is going to be the challenge, of, no matter what system uh, of publishing we're in, the current world of publishing is also confronting this maelstrom uh, of AI-generated papers. Uh, so that's, that's an issue that er no matter what uh, has to be addressed. Uh, I don't yet have a good theory uh, of how to address it, other than uh, there needing to be a program of work uh, that is clarifying what types of use and appropriate use uh, of AI for some parts of this process. And, and this is all over the map right now. There's so much uh, engagement about the potential and the potential misuse uh, of AI in supporting uh, effective and credible research uh, that we're, that's going to be the issue of the day, I think. And I think you're right. It is the most likely point of failure for this and for any uh, publishing system. So thanks for calling that out. You, you could jump uh, to John Meezy. John Meezy, uh, the reward systems are currently hijacked by for-profit companies who have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. How can you convince university leaders to change the reward system when they keep are kept so busy chasing metrics? These, I love these questions because they're really showing how the the process of publication is just one component of this very complex system. And even if university leaders themselves would say, I want, of course, all of my researchers at my institution to just be doing the most rigorous, best work they can. I don't personally care uh, about all of these metrics and you know everything else. That person is still embedded in a system where the evaluation of their university is based on those metrics by the ranking systems, by national uh, governments who decide how to allocate uh, funds to different institutions, whatever. Institutions themselves are challenged by this culture of rewards. And so this isn't an answer, but rather a call out that if we don't change those, the same uh, problems will, uh, will persist. I am, just to show that there is some attention to this, uh, I am a member of the Strategic Council for Research Integrity and Trust uh, at the National Academies of Sciences uh, in the United States. Uh, and I am, after this call, uh, have a planning meeting for our next meeting that's in next month, where we are having uh, leaders of, the, of a few different of these metrics services that evaluate universities to come and talk uh, to the, the council about how it is they structure their um, metric process, how they do this and opportunities to reform uh, those. So this is something that is recognized as a key challenge, recognized as a very difficult challenge to solve uh, and recognized as what we have to. We have to start making progress on that. Uh, or else the rest of this is going to be highly constrained, uh, given John's points. So thanks uh, for calling that out. Ryan, Olivier F. Uh, asked this question. Are there any plans to work with Coar Notify to link yeah. services? Yes, thank you for mentioning that. We have a collaboration already with Coar Notify uh, for the Open Science Framework uh, and the services that are hosted there. 
they are an excellent group that's finding ways uh, to improve some of the underbelly of just making these things discoverable and linkable and uh, connected uh, in ways that can really facilitate the public goods infrastructure of science to make all of this better. Uh, so they and many others, I think, are, are likely to be central uh, to any long-term solution for a project like this. There is another question by Andreas Eder, and he asks, uh, what role will journal editors play according to your plans? Will they still be needed to make decisions, or will that responsibility be left entirely to the reviewer community or automated services? Great question. So each of the evaluation services will have its own and has its own process, so there won't be any uh, they they will get to operate as they wish to operate, and that may have editorial management. It may be open community discussion. They may have some moderation. However, it is that they manage to produce evaluations, they will do that. Um, and so, each of those evaluations are independent, and the role of the managing editorial work for the lifecycle journal itself is more information management. How do we make sure that what's coming through is cataloged as it needs to be, has the information so the evaluation services can do their work? Uh, and how do we receive back and make sure that those evaluations get surfaced? So the idea really is decentralizing the actual content of evaluation and process of evaluation so that those services can operate independently uh, and that they have, uh, we lower the burden uh, on how it is they uh, receive and engage uh, with scholarly content through an effective uh, management process of the of the research. So thanks for uh, raising that. And there, there may be also a final question uh, by Brandon Stell. So the question is the following. Hi, Brian. I wonder if the evaluation systems you propose could be built on the existing publications like slash preprinting services. Why do you believe that a new publication system needs to be created with life cycle journals? Thank you uh, for that question. I don't know if any new technology needs to be built at all. Uh, the what, in fact, during this project period, we will build nothing ideally in terms of full engineering solutions. We have to build some things just for workflows. Uh, but the idea is to reuse as much that already exists because there's so much out there. Uh, and then just create manual flows uh, or static HTML pages uh, that get revised uh, for those things that don't exist. And part of that project period would be some community work to assess where are the technology gaps to realize the real potential uh, of this model. And, uh, and then that would be uh, what gets addressed uh, in the longer term. But a real effective solution there could be, for example, that there are five or six different uh, already public good infrastructures that create a shared roadmap for, okay, if we were able to build these seven things, then our services could talk to each other efficiently. And that's the infrastructure that manifests Lifecycle Journal. So Lifecycle Journal for this phase is really just a conceptual, like let's define the workflows and how it is that these things could be evaluated and what's surfaced and how do we think about it the technology, uh, what's the right solution, no idea, uh, and reusing as much of the existing public goods infrastructure, I think should be the priority because so much has been built and is mature and maybe would be easy to evolve uh, to, to help support and sustain this. So th thanks a lot, uh, Brian. I think that we are going to stop there because uh, it's, it has been a long time and uh, you have replied so many questions. It's already fantastic. So, uh, so it's now time to end the session. Thank you again. And thank you to all the participants for your attention and for the questions you have asked. And, uh, and again, Brian, thank you for the presentation and the discussion. So we hope to see you in three months for the talk uh, of Liad Butler. Uh, it would be the 5th of December. Do not forget this. And we hope uh, to see you again. And thanks a lot for the participation to this webinar. And have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.